Let me pray for us as we open God's word. Lord, we thank you so much for being kind to us in so many ways. Were we to ponder all of the things that you have done, all the things that you have given to all of humanity so undeserved, we would lose words. Were we to count up the blessings in our own lives of your undeserved favor, uh, we, we could never tally the score. And we thank you this morning, particularly for your church, for your people, uh, the gathered assembly of those who love you and are called together into one body by faith. We thank you for your word, for its prescriptions for our lives, for its direction. We thank you for its disclosure of you. And we pray now as we look into your word that you would be pleased by your Holy Spirit to grant power along with your word power to change our lives, to recalibrate our thinking, to root out those things which are displeasing to you, that we might experience all the benefits of it, uh, to love you more, to love one another well, to function as a monument to your grace before a watching world. And we ask all of these things and more in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. I want you to turn in your Bibles to 2 Timothy chapter 2, and verses 24 to 26 will be our text this morning. I read about an army medic who was part of an infantry battalion in Vietnam in 1970. John Chatterton was assigned a position with a roving patrol whose task was to search out enemy positions. On his very first day in combat, enemy fire broke out as the patrol walked single file into a clearing. The patrol's machine gunner was hit and dropped while the platoon scurried for cover. The machine gunner experienced five gunshot wounds to the pelvis. John Chatterton was a newbie, fresh out of training with no field experience and no combat exposure. The other medic assigned to the platoon, Chatterton's senior officer, had been with the platoon for some time, and he knew his stuff. While the injured man lay helpless, bleeding in the open, the senior medic stayed put, refusing to help. Chatterton, the newbie, jumped up, sprinted to the wounded soldier, and under intense enemy fire, dragged the six foot two, 220-pound machine gunner 50 yards back to safe cover, saving his life. There were two medics on the battlefield that day, each carrying the same equipment, each having received the same medical training, and yet they responded to a desperate situation in widely different manners. One remained in hiding while Chatterton put himself in harm's way to rescue a soldier he had only just met. John Chatterton was a different kind of man. The difference between the two men was internal. It wasn't informational, it wasn't the training, it wasn't physical ability, it was character. The question for us this morning is, what kind of character is required for critical help in times of need? We are making our way through a series entitled, Caring for Each Other in the Body of Christ. We're each responsible for our own hearts, as we have seen. We're responsible for the growth of the church as a whole. We are responsible for the spiritual welfare of our brothers and sisters in the church. And as we looked at last week, we must have a heart geared toward restoration whenever we find our brothers and sisters in spiritual danger. All of this requires being in each other's lives. All of this requires loving one another. All of this requires speaking truth to each other. Inevitably, in the milieu of life together, there will be hard conversations, conflicts, sin, opposition, division. And the preservation of the unity of the body is a real challenge. I want us to consider this morning how important character is in the pursuit of Christian unity. There's a unity which defines every Christian. It is objective and it is true whether you feel it or not. We are all one in Christ. Ephesians 2.15, Paul calls us one new man. Barriers have been broken down to bring us together, and that fundamental objective unity will be fully realized in heaven. And there is another kind of unity for which we, for which we must perpetually strive. 
Paul says in Philippians 2.2, 2, be of the same mind, maintaining the same love, united in spirit, intent on one purpose. Paul wrote to the Ephesian church, be diligent to preserve the unity of the body and the uni- unity of the spirit and the bond of peace. But the kind of character you maintain is critical. And I want us to consider this morning the condition of our own hearts. And before we do that, let's consider the condition of the battlefield on which Christian unity must be won. What do we expect from people, even people in the church? What ought we expect to find even among leaders and teachers in the church? Look at 2 Timothy chapter 3, 1 to 5. What should we expect from people? Paul wrote to Timothy, realize this, in the last days, difficult times will come. Men will be lovers of self, lovers of money, boastful, arrogant, revilers, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy, unloving, irreconcilable, malicious gossips, without self-control, brutal, haters of good, treacherous, reckless, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, holding to a form of godliness, though denying its power. We read of leaders in 2 Timothy 2, 17 and 18. Avoid worldly and empty chatter, for it will lead to further ungodliness. And their talk will spread like gangrene. Among them are Hymenaeus and Philetus, men who have gone astray from the truth, saying that the resurrection has already taken place, and they upset the faith of some. Paul warned the elders at the church at Ephesus in Acts 20, the following, Be on guard for yourselves and for all the flock over which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers, to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. I know that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. And from among your own selves, men will arise, speaking perverse things, to draw away disciples after them. Therefore, be on the alert." We ought to be on the alert for such things. And that's just what we should expect from people. What ought we expect from Satan? That he seeks people to devour. He poses as light and he masquerades in partial truths. He is allied with legions of theological minions. Paul reminded the church at Ephesus that false teaching is the doctrine of demons. And Satan is active in the church. He infiltrated the women's ministry at Ephesus in 1 Timothy 5. He infiltrated the leadership that was always a threat. 1 Timothy 3, 7, Paul says the elders of the church are vulnerable to the snare of the devil. Satan is personal, present, and powerful, and he is active in the church. So what is this battlefield upon which Christian unity must be won? Well, it's not a city, a city park designed for strolling. It is a field of mines and traps and enemy fire, all of which aim to demolish the foundational unity that Christ purchased and threaten the practical unity for which we all must strive. The church has enemies and detractors, both within and without, and every single one of us has it in us to bring division, to wreak havoc amongst the people for whom Christ died. So what kind of character is required for the challenging task of preserving unity in the church? And Paul gives us a window into these required characteristics in 2 Timothy 2, 24 to 26. Follow along as I read. The Lord's slave must not be quarrelsome, but be kind to all, able to teach, patient when wronged, with gentleness correcting those who are in opposition If perhaps God may grant them repentance, leading to the knowledge of the truth, and they may come to their senses and escape from the snare of the devil, having been held captive by him to do his will. In the church, there will inevitably be a battle for the truth, a battle for the very souls of real people. Ideas can be deadly, and a God-honoring, people-loving church will be engaged in an all-out effort to uphold the unity that Jesus prayed for his disciples. This section of scripture is aimed at pastors. Most of you here this morning are not pastors. Do not tune out. There are some critical implications for all of us in this text. 
At some level, every one of us will be faced with opportunities to contend for truth and to labor for unity with other believers. Every one of us will face the opportunity to practice godly character in the face of opposition. And I believe that the character qualities required for pastors in this task are equally requisite for every blood-bought follower of Jesus. Let's look this morning at seven necessary characteristics for dealing with church challenges. Seven necessary characteristics for dealing with church challenges. I'll give you the seven up front and then we'll walk through them. A characteristic of the kind of person required to fight for unity in the church are under submission, not quarrelsome, kind to all, able to teach, patient when wronged, correcting with meekness, and governed by love. And you can see these characteristics flow right from these three verses. There will be disagreements in the church. There will be threats to unity in the church. What kind of person must I be in order to labor for Jesus glory manifested in a unified body of followers? Number one, the Lord's slave must be under submission. Look at verse 24. Paul begins this list of descriptions by simply calling the servant of God here, the Lord's slave. See, every Christian is a slave to God, a slave to Christ, a slave to righteousness and under the reign of grace. And Paul here is specifically talking to Timothy with immediate implications for pastors, for leaders in the church and shepherds. In verse 20, Paul outlines that in a large house, there are not only gold and silver vessels, but also vessels of wood and earthenware, some to honor, some to dishonor. Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from these things, he will be a vessel for honor, sanctified, useful to the master, prepared for every good work. And then he encourages Timothy to flee, pursue, and reject certain things. Flee youthful passions, pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace, and refuse foolish and ignorant speculations. And notice that when Paul gets to verse 24, he sets his sight on all pastors, those beyond Timothy, speaking in the third person rather than just to Timothy. He says, the Lord's slave, any who would be the Lord's slave in these roles. And the immediate application is to all shepherds in churches. Now, what would it mean for a leader in the church to see himself as the slave of the Lord? Well, it means that he is one under submission, under the authority of another obligated to Jesus desires. It also means that you're accountable to God for his methods and you are to represent his character. You see, you can't just go about God's business any old way with any old character to be Jesus slave in the midst of conflict in the church is to recognize his exclusive claim to direct your actions and your methods You must be about his business in his way. It will not do to write your own script for the meager abilities that you have. It will not be okay for you to make up your path for solving disunity or to come up with your own means. There's great comfort in being a slave. There's a freedom in it. The battle is not ultimately ours. The victory does not rest on our abilities. We follow his orders and we trust him for the results. A slave is under submission to his master. There's a second mandatory characteristic for those who would labor for unity in the church. It's also in verse 24. He must not be quarrelsome, not quarrelsome. That is the Lord's slave must not be argumentative or given to verbal fighting. And we need to back up to verse 23 to understand what Paul has in mind here. He says to Timothy, refuse foolish and ignorant speculations knowing that they produce quarrels. Refuse foolish. The word there is moronic and ignorant or uneducated, untrained, undisciplined speculations. That is a series of endless off the map discussions, arguments about things about which the Bible does not address. Paul probably had in mind here the Jewish myths and extra biblical genealogical spats that he warned both Timothy and Titus about. Perhaps he also has in mind those infiltrators who attempted to compel Christians to subject themselves to Old Testament procedures in order to produce a right standing before God. 
Whatever the specific topics, they were out of bounds. They were off the map. You, you couldn't put chapter and verse on a topic and settle the issue with your Bible open. Paul says very curtly, refuse the conversation. Why? He tells us in verse 23, because they produce, literally they give birth to quarrels. They give birth to arguments. You can't have unity fighting for your own opinions. You will never have unity if you fight for your own preferences. Speculative inquiry is the mother of arguments. You, you go off the script of scripture and come up with newfangled ideas. Then there's no authoritative arbiter of opinions. Someone can come up with a novel theological thought, win a hearing, gain popular appeal. And someone else puts forward a competing opinion. And the fight is on. A fight that may never end because neither has an interest in what God's word says but only in speaking his mind. And the result of such quarrels is division in the church. And Paul tells Timothy, refuse them, reject them, do not entertain them, refuse moronic, uneducated, untrained, undisciplined speculations. And then after a first and second warning, Paul tells Titus that you are to reject not only the ideas that produce division, but the man himself who produces division. In verse 24, Paul addresses the leaders in the church with a serious prohibition. You must not be quarrelsome. Why? Because quarrelsomeness, argumentativeness, is a character flaw. It's a character flaw that actually hinders rather than promotes the truth. Listen, an argumentative man makes good truth look bad. Imagine a piano player with a sheet of Debussy on the music stand. And he technically plays all the right notes in the correct order, but he has no touch. He manhandles the keys and brutalizes an otherwise beautiful progression of notes. He is like, to really mix metaphors here, William the Refrigerator Perry running the football for the 1985 Chicago Bears. He was a 335-pound defensive lineman, and he was handed the ball Several times, he threw a touchdown pass and ran a couple in. If you wanted to see the football get across the goal line in a short yardage situation, you might hand off the ball to the fridge. But if you really wanted to see the football run beautifully, you watched Barry Sanders. He just handled it differently. And if Barry Sanders and William the Refrigerator Perry were both piano players... Which one might play WC better? I don't know. It's possible to play all of WC's notes, but demolish the song to totally miss the intention of the composer by the way that you play. And the quarrelsome man, even if he is hitting on right doctrine, misses God's intent. He is a poser, opposing the prose of the composer. And Paul tells Timothy, don't be like that guy. Don't be quarrelsome. If you take on the character flaw inherent in the divisive man, you will not win unity for the church of God. You will in fact destroy what you set out to build. The end here does not justify the means. Getting to truth with a quarrelsome character mars the truth. A quarrelsome Christian possesses defective character. He or she assumes that a spiritual battle can be fought with fleshly implements tone of voice, force of personality, a show of intellectual prowess, or clever debating strategies. An argumentative person makes good truth look bad. John Calvin wrote, the more progress any man has made in the art of disputing and fighting, the more unfit he will be for serving Christ. How do I know if I'm a quarrelsome person? I think this is seen in the contrast to the following character traits. The third characteristic we must have if we are to labor for unity in the church is to be kind to all. Look again at verse 24. The Lord's slave must not be quarrelsome, but be kind to all. Kindness is an essential character quality for those who must be engaged in upholding truth and the preservation of relationships in the church. Notice, kind to all, that is, kind to sheep, kind enough to sheep under your care to actually protect them. Kind in your demeanor to even the one who comes with a quarrel. 
The slave of God must be able to return a volley of self-promoting quarrels with a salvo of genuine kindness. And this kindness is a reflection of God's own treatment of his enemies. We are to mirror him. To fight the fire of the argumentative man with the tongue of quarrelsome retribution will only set entire forests ablaze. The tongue is a restless evil full of deadly poison. And I think God knows that pastors in particular, for whom speaking is an occupational hazard, need to be reminded of the dangers of speaking. We need to be afraid of the tongue. How easily bitterness and thanklessness and complaining and one-upmanship, a lust for control or self-aggrandizement come through the tongue. Kindness is not the enemy of difficult conversations. Even when a confrontation is required, kindness is an essential quality required in difficult conversations. Genuine kindness in the midst of opposition evidences a humility that yields to the Spirit's work and trusts God for the outcome. Kindness has a remarkable power in a dispute. If you persevere in kindness with your opponents, you will display the supernatural power of the Spirit of God who is able to subdue your natural inclinations. As one pastor has written, there is power in a life that refuses to quarrel and is gentle with detractors. It is the power of Christ's likeness. Now, don't mistake gentle wording and low tones with genuine kindness. Calm speech can be a mask for smooth, manipulative, cutting words. Genuine kindness is not a tool to win an argument. Genuine kindness is the overflow of the love of God in you, reflected in genuine affection, selfless speech for the benefit of others. God has been kind to you, friends. In our labor for unity in the midst of conflict, God's kindness through us is essential. We must be under submission, not quarrelsome, kind to all. And a fourth essential quality is this, able to teach. Verse 24 again. This ability to teach pressed as a qualification for entering into difficult conversation is really important. It is the same characteristic required for all who hold the office of pastor in 1 Timothy 3. A man must be above reproach, able to teach. That is, the man must be competent to bring the truth of Scripture to bear on the lives and situations of those under care. To be able to teach sound doctrine effectively. To be skillful in teaching. And this is a very interesting requirement. This means that God's plan for unity is not for us to put our ideas away as if they don't matter. That we just sing kumbaya and live happily ever after. No, the Lord's vision for unity is a different kind of unity. The Lord's faithful slave must be competent to speak appropriate biblical truths into whatever comes along. This quality demands a thorough and accurate knowledge of God's word. God's brand of unity will not come at the expense of the truth of his word. Rather, unity will be attained through the truth of his word. And we make the mistake when we try to get unity by looking at each other and settling our differences halfway between. How do we get biblical unity? What's the biblical prescription for that? Align ourselves with Jesus who is the head and the closer we get to him through his word, the closer we will find ourselves to each other. And we must labor for these things. A fifth characteristic is to be patient when wronged. Look at the end of verse 24. The Lord's slave must be patient when wronged. This is an ability to bear up under evil treatment without resentment, without bitterness. It is to be quick to forgive, slow to take offense, not giving offense in return. Anybody can retaliate. It is in our nature to do so. But such a response actually undermines the great truths we might think we're defending through retaliation. What it proves is that we're more interested in defending and promoting ourselves than we are in promoting the glory of God and love for his church. God's truth can stand on its own. It doesn't require my retaliatory efforts to bring another down. To be patient when wronged is to exercise control over the residual sinful tendencies that remain in our own hearts. Are you easily irritated when wronged? Or have you disciplined yourself to think first and most about the great offense your own sins have brought against heaven? 
We ought to be motivated by jealousy for God's honor and selfless love for God's people. Consider Jesus Christ. When he came to the earth the first time, he did not come to be served, but to serve. He had every right to cast fire on the earth, but instead, willingly, he went misunderstood, maligned, and murdered in order to accomplish the purpose of God on behalf of sinners who believe. He is the supreme example of patience when wronged. To be a useful instrument for God's purposes in the church, his servants, eager for unity, must be patient when wronged. There's a sixth qualification here, and it's in verse 25. The Lord's slave must, with gentleness, correct those who are in opposition, if perhaps God may grant them repentance, leading to the knowledge of the truth. Correcting. This word in verse 25, to correct, is the exact opposite of the word used in verse 23 for ignorant. That is the untrained, undisciplined. To correct is to train them, to to bring them into correction, to discipline the undisciplined, to bring instruction to the ignorant. And the obligation here is not just to correct the doctrinal error, but also to bring correction, training, and discipline to the character flaw that produces the quarrelsome man. The opposer needs to be taught truth. And he needs to be trained in self-control. He needs to learn to submit to the authority of the word of God and the authority of the shepherds of God in the church, even as those shepherds submit to and answer to the Lord. You see, the opposer has a morbid delight in confrontation, a morbid delight in arguments, a morbid delight in self-promotion at the expense of God's people. Young men in good churches often pride themselves in being able to find places where they disagree with their pastors. They wear it as a badge, believing that it demonstrates courage, discernment, or exegetical ability. But to broadcast the differences you hold with your local church leadership only demonstrates the flaws in your character, contention, immaturity, lack of love, and exaltation of self at the expense of others. I have seen this tendency in my own heart. I have been thankful for those brave enough and kind enough to correct me. The opposer has an information problem and a character deficiency, and both of these must be addressed. So the servant of God must be able and ready to correct him. Notice the manner in which this correction is to be done with meekness. Paul says in verse 25, with meekness. That is uh, gentleness. It's not weakness. It is actually power under control. This is a word used of young horses being tamed and bridled so that their power could be useful in the hands of a rider. This meekness flows out of the very character of God and ought to characterize his servants. This meekness is not opposed to strength of conviction. It is rather strength of conviction clothed in personal humility. It is so easy to write off an ungodly rebuke. It is harder to to dismiss one delivered in love, in gentleness, with an obvious longing for repentance. Think about it, Christian. When you have personally been offended or when you see a brother or sister in Christ who needs correction, how do you package that? Do you wear the heart of your Savior? Meekness. Conviction under self-control with gentleness, seeking the good of the brother or the sister. There's a seventh characteristic given here, and it is to be governed by love. This is picked up in the second half of verse 25 into verse 26. We are to correct those who are in opposition. If perhaps God may grant them repentance, leading to the knowledge of the truth, and they may come to their senses and escape from the snare of the devil, having been held captive by him to do his will. We can summarize all of this by saying we ought to be governed by love. And really this outline point could be labeled governed by love and governed by a confidence in the power of God to rescue anyone. But that would be too long for an outline point. The point of Paul's instruction here is one of hope, 
one of compassion, one of love. He says, if perhaps a lest perchance, this is sort of a, a grammatical way to give hope against hope. Technically, it indicates an unlikely possibility. In fact, there's not much human reason to think that he might change. Because those who have opposed doctrine in the church or those who have been characterized by stirring up strife, those who must be removed for being factious, they are hard cases. Why is that? Because they have long ago stopped listening to others. They have become infatuated with the sound of their own voice, have drowned out or tuned out the voices of others. They are unteachable. And yet Paul holds out gospel hope for the hard case. And the slave of God, the servant of God, must reflect this confidence. God can do the impossible. And notice what the impossible looks like in verse 26. Repentance leading to a knowledge of the truth, coming to their senses, and escaping the snare of the devil. This begins with a repentance unto truth. Again, the solution to division in the church is not a surrender of ideas. If we all just lay down our claims of ideas, we can be together. That's not how unity works. But it comes with winning the divisive man to the truth of the word of God. This is why it's critical that we be able to handle the word of God with one another. And that shepherds be adequately equipped to teach the word of God. And then this repentance must come about by the supernatural work of the spirit of God. To make a 180 degree turn. From the character flaw producing opposition to a humble faith response. The hope is that they would come to their senses. Literally, this phrase means a coming to sobriety. The implied opposite of that is a drunkenness, an intoxication. The word to come to their senses is used to recover from a drunken stupor. The rescue here is a rescue from Satan's intoxicating trap. I remember being a kid, uh, being captivated by carnivorous plants. You know, the meat-eating kind. The Venus flytrap or, or the pitcher pot. And the pitcher pot in the rainforest would put out an intoxicating aroma that would draw a bug or even a small mammal into its inescapable basin where it would slowly digest its dying victim. Intellectualism can be an intoxicating trap. Gaining a following can be an intoxicating trap. Having influence can be an intoxicating trap. And listen, sometimes we want others to follow us for personal affirmation. If, if I have a gang of people around me that are high-fiving me, then I can look over my character flaws or my... Failure to accord with God's truth. It's like an endorsement. An endorsement of the direction that we're headed. It's a stamp of approval. It it can be a band-aid over a damaged conscience. The bad doctrine or bad living might characterize my life. But you know, people like me and they're following me. So I must be okay. That's a trap. Why is it that people tend to defect from sound doctrine? Why do people who uphold the truth for a time defect from the truth? My own life is marked by those moments when mentors and friends and pastors have defected from the truth. And perhaps you have friends who have walked away from the truth of the gospel who once boldly proclaimed Christ, who no longer walk with him. Why do people go down these paths? The reasons may be as numerous as the perpetrators. Some get bored with the same old truths. They don't want to just say what's been said before. Where's the glory for me in that? I want to be saying something new so that I'm a little bit ahead of everybody else. So they look to me to listen to something novel. There is that appeal of novelty. We, we all love to be the first to break some juicy news, to introduce a new band to the populace, to recommend the latest book. But novelty can become a tool for self-promotion. 
And theological novelty, theological speculation is fertile soil for this kind of pride to flourish. That someone might have some exciting, fresh idea that no one else is saying, come listen to me. It's an intoxication. There are other reasons that people depart from the truth and a life and doctrine go hand in hand. It is no mistake in the New Testament that every time you see a description or a warning about false teachers, there is with that description a faulty life. And really the relationship between bad doctrine and bad living can go either way. Bad living is actually a reflection of bad theology. And so if you go down a path, you're attracted to bad theology that will eventually work its way out into bad living. And Paul says, some men's sins go before them. That means they're obvious to all. And some men's sins follow after them. It means we find out later. But bad theology, when held, will eventually result in bad living. And that relationship can go the other way around too. And it's, it can be easy to see how it would work. If, if I'm not keeping a clean conscience and short accounts before God, if I am seared in my conscience, not breaking patterns of sin, but keeping things secret and unconfessed and hoping to just get along. Well, eventually what happens in the psychology of our thinking is we start to say, wow, I tried the gospel and it's just not working. I'm not putting to death the deeds of the body by the Holy Spirit. So thinking about Christ and reading my Bible and praying and going to church and all the normal disciplines that a Christian ought to be a part of, it doesn't work. And you begin to get in your mind the perspective of, I've been there and I've done that and it's been ineffective. What's been ineffective is the Spirit-led discipline to put to death the deeds of the body while there's been a surface adherence to Christian things. But eventually those Christian things fail to corral an ungodly life. And that ungodly life denies the gospel. And then the theology follows the bad living. Notice the progression here in verse 26. They ought to come to their senses and escape the snare of the devil, having been held captive by him to do his will. This progression is interesting. Following satanic deception comes this intoxication that they need to sober up from. This intoxication comes from an entrapment that is the snare of the devil and an enslavement. They are held captive by him to do his will. That is such picturesque language. Of a frightening reality. Held captive by him to do his will. That is they're taken alive and enlisted. This is worse than the intoxicating trap of a pitcher pot in the rainforest. Which kills and eats its victim. Satan's intoxicating trap rewrites the programming of its victim. And then uses that victim to be a perpetrator. Disseminating error. Leading others astray. Creating division. And trapping and and destroying still more victims. Satan's ploy here is much more like the fungus that infects the South American bullet ant. The bullet ant is the king carnivore of the rainforest. A bullet ant is the colony, um, a bullet ant colony, excuse me, is an undauntable army of well-armed soldiers that has no animal enemies. It possesses the highest rated sting among insects on the notorious Schmidt pain sting index. Named, of course, after Justin Schmidt, the entomologist. The insect scientist. He was the creator of a rating scale for pain from insect stings. And he scaled the pain of these insects by trying them out. And if you're curious, number two on the list is native to the Phoenix area. It is the Pepsis wasp or the tarantula hawk. It's number two on the list. But number one on the list is the bullet ant of South America. It gets a four plus on a scale of one to four. In fact, Justin Schmidt's description of a bullet ant bite reads like a high-end coffee tasting session. He describes it this way. 
pure, intense, brilliant pain. Like fire walking over flaming charcoal with a three inch rusty nail in your heel. But the bullet ant for all of its bulletproof ferocity has one enemy. It is susceptible to a fungal infection that takes over its central nervous system. The fungus eats away the brain of the bullet ant, but continues to operate its life support functions. The fungus then drives its zombified host toward the ant's home colony, where it will send out fungal spores to infect more ants. The ant is taken captive alive and enslaved by the fungus to accomplish the fungal will. Opposers in the church intoxicated and entrapped have become zombie hosts for Satan's destructive operations, wandering into the church and taking people down with them. So what must the faithful servant of God do? Correct them. And if need be warn them and reject them, but correct them with this hope. Perhaps God may grant them repentance coming to a knowledge of the truth. Even in such serious situations, the slave of God must be marked by compassion, love, a heart of rescue. If perchance God may set them free from their self-destructive course. Consider your own rescue, friends. You were opposed to God. You were a card-carrying member of the kingdom of darkness. You were at enmity We were all zombified dupes of the prince of the power of the air. By nature, children of wrath, even as the rest. But God. God made us alive in Christ. God sent his son. What is the result for those who believe in Jesus Christ? In his finished work on the cross to actually pay for every sin, past, present, and future for all who believe. What is the result of all those who are joined to God by faith in Christ? Adoption through propitiation. That is, we were in the wrong family and we get brought into God's family by grace. Not by anything we deserve, not by anything we could earn, but simply because God loved the unlovely. And that adoption comes by propitiation. That is a satisfying of divine wrath by an innocent substitute. Just like all those animal sacrifices in the Old Testament, they pictured a a victim who did not sin, dying in the place of sinners who did sin so that sinners could go free. Those were all pointing to the perfect sacrifice, the Lord Jesus Christ, who came to earth as a baby at Bethlehem so that he could die on a cross at Calvary, so that he could take upon himself all the sins of everyone who would ever believe, pay for them in his own death to set us free. And so we become not just free from our enslavement to sin and all of its consequences, But we are free in adoption as sons and daughters of the God who is offended at our sin and embraces us in his love through the work of Jesus Christ. Do you remember your own rescue? The one who personally rescued you from who you were is also the supreme example of the slave of the Lord. He did not open his mouth on the way to the cross. He was kind to all. He was able to teach. He was patient when wronged in ways perhaps we will never understand. With gentleness, correcting us, granting us repentance and escape from the snare of the devil. To be what Paul enjoins for pastors and for all Christians from this text is to be like Christ. Christian, do you have what it takes to be useful to the master in his house? If you have encountered the awful holiness of God and you have been forgiven, you have a story to tell to the world and a life to live in the household of faith. From this context, we would say, cleanse ourselves of the things that promote disunity and let us pursue righteousness and faith and love and peace with all who call on the Lord from a pure heart. 
there are, I hope, obvious implications for pastors here in this text. But there are implications for all of us, uh, one of which is holding pastors accountable to these things, praying for pastors to be like this. But also for all of us to be discerning about novel ideas and argumentative people. Paul tells us in Romans to keep your eye on those who cause dissensions. That we ought to be wary of these things. We ought not be surprised that they happen. We ought to know our own hearts well enough that we have it in us to create division. And so to be wary and concerned and caring for one another is the task of all believers in the church. We ought to be wary about those who are disruptors of unity and, and wary of ourselves first. Is someone just an opposer? Just characterized by always picking a fight, starting a brawl. Watch out for such a one. That is a character flaw and not to be followed. Even if his doctrine is correct, his heart has been revealed as ungodly. And we need to think about ourselves to be useful in the church. We cannot descend to the same character flaws in order to bring correction to those who oppose. We don't wield as an implement of righteousness, the character flaw of an ungodly opponent. And you might think about the applications of that to extended family or difficult situations in a workplace. Will you stoop to the same measures that are brought against you? Or will you transcend those and aim to be like your savior? Look, this is an important principle for every aspect of life for a Christian. We all must pursue the kind of character that's necessary for the preservation and promotion of unity in the church. The church as a body interdependent, interconnected depends on it and our corporate witness to the world of our savior depends on it as well. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus You love your church. You love your church far more, far better than we ever could. You know our tendencies. You know our feebleness. You know our weaknesses. You know where we are prone to bitterness or thanklessness or retaliation. You know each one of us better than we know ourselves. That we pray that the characteristics we've just been exposed to would mark us. That we would be people who are people of love and discernment and conviction and courage and meekness all blended together. Lord Jesus, we are asking to be more like you. We pray that you would grant according to the riches of your glory, that we would be strengthened with power through your spirit in our inner man so that Christ may dwell in our hearts through faith that we being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all the saints, the breadth and length and height and depth of that love to know the love of Christ, which surpasses knowledge that we may be filled up to all your fullness and to you, O God, who are able to do far more abundantly beyond all that we ask or think according to your power that works in us to you be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen.